Yes, sir. Does a group like that get within the societies and the governments and the uh, intellectual circles in the countries which they, you know, have an opinion on? Uh, are, are they seen as, well, you know, that's fine, but you're not here in Cairo, you're not here in Baghdad, you're not here in Kabul? Yes, there's definitely the idea that countries know best what's happening within their borders. So, for example, there was a very large demonstration in Morocco last year that was an anti-terrorism demonstration. And there were elements of the society there that argued for the incorporation of other people just from other Muslim countries, not even from outside, not even from the West, such as from the United States. And the argument was in general, well, no. People in Morocco understand the Moroccan situation, and so let's just stay within here. So the voices are very present in the different countries, but yes, we can't assume that there is one large pan-Islam voice that would then draw from these different areas. Like any religion, people are divided along national lines and have national identities that definitely supersede that. But in terms of the mainstream idea, the cartoon that I showed with the black hooded figure and the words extremism on it, do capture the dominant ideology. It's just people prefer a dominant local ideology. Huh? Yes, ma'am. So the question was about how many members belong to this group. In general, American Muslims who are practicing Muslims have very strong ties to these groups. So they see these groups as representatives of them. So whether it's CARE or the Muslim Public Affairs Council or similar organizations, they are a way for American Muslims to basically coalesce and create significant changes. So even if the changes look small, they're a way that people, there's something that people look at to create this. So numbers-wise, the membership would probably not really reflect the actual affiliation that people will feel. You know, to be a member, you have to pay dues and that sort of thing. Whereas the affiliation that people feel, people certainly feel a very strong affiliation to these groups. Yes. Could you briefly explain about Sharia law? Uh, in my ignorance, it see, I, I don't know if that is an extreme form of Islam or is that type of law supported within the Quran? Could you just talk about that? Sure. So the question was about Sharia law and whether that's an extreme form of Islam or whether that's something that's supported in the Quran. The Quran combines verses that have to do with everyday dealings, morals, etc., with verses that are legal codes. And the reason for that is because Muhammad, as a figure, was both a religious leader, but also was in the unusual situation of being a political leader. When he moved from the city of Mecca to the city of Medina, he actually ended up being a political leader of that city and a leader over Muslims and non-Muslims. As a result, there are parts of the Quran that then have these religious codes. Religious codes in the Quran, while we hear about them all the time, they actually are a minority of Quranic verses. And they deal with very specific elements. So there are rules around family law, there are rules around penal law, there are rules around civil law. How they're interpreted and when and where they're actually applied varies greatly from country to country. Similarly, Muslims disagree on what parts of them should be applied and how. And I can go into detail about this, but basically there is an idea that some of them are perhaps rules that are no longer valid in this day and age, or the circumstances that made them valid are no longer in place. So for some people, they will take these rules and interpret them very, very rigidly. So the groups that we hear about, the Taliban, etc., that's ultimately what they're doing. If you're not sure how to interpret something, then better err on the side of caution in case you're doing something that goes against the religion. But for most people, that's not how they tend to see them. So there are certain rules that they will apply, but in general, the whole system in and of itself, they don't see as something that applies to their daily life to every single part of it. When it comes to Muslim countries, the only country that says that it's applying the, the Sharia law completely is Saudi Arabia. So Iran, which is a theocracy, has a constitution, is a very different model. But Saudi Arabia says that the Quran is the constitution. In most other Muslim countries, there might be a law here and a law there that's applied, but in general, the laws applied are secular.
goes to this side and then go back here. Yes. south of North Africa um, to other areas in the African continent where there are clashes, tensions between Christian populations and Muslim populations. Is there anything uniquely different about those con uh, conflicts than tensions in the uh, North Africa and the Middle East? Okay. So the question was that I highlighted North Africa and the Middle East, but are there conflicts that are in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, that um, are connected to Muslims and Christians fighting, and are the, is the situation different somehow there than it is in the Middle East and North Africa, correct? So, yes, I think the primary conflict that comes to mind, of course, is that of Sudan. So not Darfur, because Darfur isn't a Christian-Muslim conflict overall. Darfur is actually a conflict between two different groups. But most of the group in Darfur that's being targeted is not Christian. But Sudan had the other experience of a Muslim-Christian war. There is a general rule about these issues. And I think one can see it, if we go outside of the Muslim world for a moment, one can see it in Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland in the 70s, 80s, early 90s, there was a Catholic-Protestant divide. And it was a political divide that ultimately was masked by the Catholic-Protestant differentiation. And there is something similar to that here. So the Christian-Muslim differentiation in Sudan is connected to political situations. Anytime there is a political tension, it's very easy to then create another agenda that makes that political division even more absolute. To say, oh, this group is this and that group is that, and that's why they're fighting. Whereas the group never had this issue before. So, for example, in Sudan, there are many, many issues that have to do with regional divisions, tribal divisions, etc. They coalesced in this, into this Christian-Muslim divide, but this almost was an arbitrary d division because when we get to Darfur, the tribal elements are all still there, the problems are all still there, but they're no longer a Muslim-Christian division. So the political situation is really what dictates that, and then it happens, it so happens that then the allegiances fall in this way. All right, yes, sir. Can you talk for a minute about how the Quran deals with women that may be a, a root uh, uh, rationalization for the subservience of women in many uh, either Arabic or Muslim countries, everything ranging from no education to Saudi Arabia can't drive, can't own property, or males can have many wives, women can only have one husband, inheritance of property, uh, orphans, who gets the child. That okay. Did everybody hear the question? Yes. Okay. It's hard for me to talk about that in a minute, but I'll do my best. So it's a huge topic that could easily have its own lecture series, right? There are a number of issues here. The Quran is, as a religious text, was a religious text that w came in the seventh century. It was dealing with the status quo of the seventh century. It compared to the status quo of the, se the seventh century was actually what could be described as a feminist document. So it argued against girls being buried alive, which was a regular part of the status quo in the seventh century. It gave women the right to divorce. Yes, limited compared to men, but the right is there. It gave women the right of inheritance. Again, limited compared to men, but it was a major step. So yes, in the seventh century, it was a feminist document. Today, in the 21st century, we can look at it and say, but men and women here are unequal. And so this is something that now creates inequality for women. But religious texts run this risk. Right? I mean, the Quran is not the only religious text that favors men in certain ways over women. And this is an issue that has come up before in other religious texts. When it comes to the Quran itself and interpretation, the verses themselves, it's very clear what's going on. Men and women, in terms of faith, are seen as completely equal. So Arabic, in which the Quran was originally written, is similar to Spanish and French in that if you have one man and three women, for example, or 50 women for that matter, you use a masculine plural. 
However, Arabic has the distinction of also having a feminine plural, and the Quran specifically will say to the believers, and it's a male form, and to the believers, and it's a female form, so often translated as the believing men and the believing women. Faith is very clearly open to both. The verses that then talk about women's rights are very much connected to the status quo of the time. And the genre that I described, the occasions for revelation, make that very clear. The application of this, of course, is a whole other story. And I think this is where we can be a little bit misled because of our Western bias, if you will. For example, if you go to a church in the Arab world, you see that men and women are treated differently. Is that because the country is Muslim dominant and the customs have rubbed off on the people there? Or is it because it's culturally part and parcel of the culture predating Islam that men and women are treated differently? And this, of course, is something that could be argued back and forth. But certainly, the cultural elements have a part to do with this. The variation that you mentioned between country to country is connected to other elements that are in place. So some of these countries have very strong affiliations to tribal codes that are not connected to religion. Others don't, and as a result, the laws, as you mentioned, differ. So Saudi Arabia, for example, is the only Muslim-majority country where women can't drive. Nowhere else in the Muslim world is that the case, so you see that variation. So the variation is also connected to these particular elements. Then, finally, the final piece I'll put here, even though there are so many other things, is the economic situation is highly relevant. So when we talk about education in girls' schools, for example, if we're talking about a rural area in Afghanistan or Pakistan, let's say the book Three Cups of Tea was very prominent. Some of you might have read it, and Greg Mortensen has this campaign to build girls' schools. They're in rural areas. If you are a farmer with 12 children, and you only can really afford to send three to school, you're probably going to send the three boys under those circumstances because the three girls, somebody could marry them, and then they won't be able, you know, they are able to provide for themselves in another way. It's a very different way of thinking, but it's also a way of thinking that matches against a poorer infrastructure. So these are some of the pieces of this, but there's many more that could be part of this discussion. The dominant Middle Eastern narrative you presented of jihad was one of self-defense, but there are other narratives one could think of. There's one that goes, the jihad is not limited to self-defense, but won't stop until an Islamic caliphate is established all over the world. There's yet another narrative which goes, it's nothing to do with this world at all, but about certain rewards and pleasures in paradise. So, among these three, uh, what is the relative contribution of each, and what drives most of the youngsters buying into this? Okay. The second narrative that you presented, the narrative that has to do with an Islamic caliphate, is actually an extreme version of the first narrative that I presented, which is the most common one. So th that's the common one taken to an extreme. That the world is unjust no matter what, and the only way to reach justice is to create this Islamic caliphate, this Islamic world order. So this is an extension of that narrative, but it's a minority view of that narrative. The other point that you raise that has to do with the rewards in paradise that we also hear about. So this idea that a man who com commits some sort of suicide bombing will then end up with 72 virgins in paradise. This is something that we hear about. And there are a couple of points here. One of them is, first of all, that suicide is prohibited in Islam. So this person actually is defining himself as a martyr. And martyrdom then has a reward. But martyrdom, according to the Quran, has a reward for both men and women, incidentally. So women have young men that would serve them in paradise, and men have young women that would serve them in paradise, according to this belief. For most people, this idea that suicide equals martyrdom is seen as completely false. And most Muslim groups will say, this is suicide, which is prohibited. This is not martyrdom. However, again, connected to economic situations, it's very easy to prey on a young man who is unemployed, has a future that looks like it's going to be a bad future, sad, dismal situation, and say, Okay, well, you know, your life is really bad right now, but oh, if you commit this act, then you'll be rewarded in the next life. So this serves as a lure 
for disenfranchised young people, actually not even just men anymore, to do this. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the film Paradise Now, which was a very good movie depicting this exactly. Two young Palestinian men who basically are completely disenfranchised and are lured by this figure who encourages them to carry out a suicide bombing in Israel. And it's precisely this agenda that, you know, if you have nothing to live for in this life, it's, pretty, it's not that difficult for somebody to say to you, okay, your life now is bad anyhow, but oh, if you do this, first of all, your family will be rewarded, they'll be able to live better, because there's usually financial compensation connected to that, and even better, in the next life, you'll have this wonderful reward that then these gullible young people, unfortunately, believe. Let's give a wonderful applause for it.